Caesar Briscoe and Bradshaw. I would be Bradshaw. That would be your Chickasaw native, your Chickasaw Hall of Famer, Oklahoma's favorite son, Mr. Gerald Briscoe. And what a treat we got today. It name doesn't get any bigger. The legend doesn't get any bigger. He was a three-time world champion, two-time ECW champion, one-time India NWA champion, the suicidal, genocidal, homicidal, death-defying maniac. He is Mr. Sabu. Sabu, welcome to the show. It's great to have you on. Thank you. I'm honored. Honored to, have, honored to be here, John, Jerry. Thank you uh, very much, Terry. Do uh, you mind if I call you Terry? You want me to call you Sabu? On this? Uh, I kind of mind the Terry. I don't like Terry. Sabu, oh, please. They don't like Terry. <laughs> I never, I never like Jerry either. <laughs> <laughs> See, my uncle named me Sabu, so I can consider it a God-given name. I didn't name myself that. And, and now I, I, you know, I like the name better than Terry. Yeah. Well, I, well, welcome to the show, Sabu, and uh, we're a pleasure to have you. You know, we've been trying to hunt you down, and you and I played a little, I guess, Facebook or social media tag. <laughs> yeah. But we've got you, man. That's the bottom line here, and uh, it's, it's an honor to have you on. And, uh, you know, as John said, I think it was off off the air, but one of the, one of the great things we get to do is do a little research uh, on these guys that we have on. And watching some of your stuff, man, it's terrifying there, but we'll get into all that. I want to take you back to, uh, to your days, you know, your, your, your pre days, uh, and, uh, before you became Sabu and, uh, and all, all the stuff that, that you did there and you had a little bit of amateur wrestling career or what, what yeah, was that? I wrestled you five years to study that to become a professional wrestler. Yeah. I, I wrestled five years amateur. Five years. I were yeah. in school or what was it? Yeah. Just high, junior high and high school. Yeah. Good. Did, did, did you win any championships or you, you no, just... not, not really. I was just, uh, it was all to get me ready for pro wrestling. So I yeah. thought, I thought amateur wrestling was fake. <laughs> it, it is fake. It, it, it is. Amateur wrestling, the NFL and the NBA, they're all fake. We're, we're yeah. the only things that are legit. Right. Well, wait a minute. Roller derby is legit too. Jack. Roller derby is legit too. <laughs> hey, what did your uncle think about your amateur wrestling? Cause you, you grew up near your uncle, right? Yeah, he, he didn't watch me while I was in high school, but he always said to stick with it. You know, like when I'd go out to his house on Sunday and my mom would tell him that I was wrestling on the wrestling team, and he goes, yeah, stick with it. We'll stick with it. And, and I did. You know, I really didn't want to be a part of the team, but I stuck with it to learn how to wrestle. And well, it was well, 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 you, you have uh, several brothers and sisters. N none of them were interested in getting into professional no. wrestling. You're the only one that looked at yeah, it and thought, I, I want to be like my uncle. Yeah, I'm, I'm the youngest, and... uh Youngest of seven, and uh, no, nobody else was interested. Well, when did you realize that your your uncle was uh, was was something special in all over the world, but especially there in Michigan area? Uh, when I was about five years old, I noticed that he was different than everybody else. Because for one, I'd see him on TV, and you know, two, he always uh, he always acted and looked like a star. <laughs> really. And the reason yeah. I say really, I'm surprised, you know, because some guys are just like that. You know, Skandar Akbar, uh, who, who helped me so much in my career, and Bobby Duncan Jr., I know you're good friends with. Skandar always said Luthez, when he walked in a room, always you felt like he was a star. And some guys, uh, you felt presence. like they were a star. Your your uncle had that presence, right? Right. Yes, he sure did. Before we come on, before we came on the air, John and I were talking a little bit before you, 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 you were able to get on and, and, uh, and I and he asked me if I knew your uncle. I really didn't know your uncle that well, but you know, I, I was telling John one of the great things about working in Florida is everybody from the north wanted to come down here on vacation. <laughs> and oh, yeah. so, of course, back in the old days, they feel you know you get bu booked down there, you could write it off on your taxes, and uh, you know make a payday and and enjoy the sunshine. And but you're right, man. Your uncle uh, would walk into the dressing room. He was always immaculately dressed, and he just his hair was just right, and he looked like a star. Just right. in, on that same uh, tone as uh, John said about Luther, when he come in, man, you you knew this guy was a was a star. So I'd always kind of watch and look. Is this the same guy that I've seen in the magazines and all that? You uh, know, the crazy guy and uh, all that. But right. yeah, he he was a star. So. I, I also read a little bit during the research of where he'd have, have these Sunday Sunday dinners. You know, back in the old days, we didn't, you know, <laughs> the wrestling did, really didn't run a lot on Sundays. And so uh, well, that's when promoters would, would have their 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 dinners and all that stuff. And some of the guys, what I found amusing when you said it is that the good guys would be in one room and the bad guys would be in the other. <laughs> yeah. He was at, at his house. <laughs> yeah, that was funny when I see that. First, when I first seen the, 
heels and baby faces were separated. I go, oh fuck, the baby faces are here because I was a heel guy. <laughs> I go, oh, they're fucking, they're gonna start a fight. No. <laughs> but see, that's a true heel. A true heel believes that the baby faces are the heels. Uh, exactly, <laughs> and most of the time they are. The true baby face or the, the baby face in the ring is usually the true asshole. Did, did, did those guys I've, always, the I've always heard that said. If you want to hang out with somebody cool, hang out with the heels. You'll have, you'll have heels. fun. You'll have a good time. <laughs> Especially back in the old days when the heels were heels. You know? <laughs> right. oh. Nowadays, you can't tell the difference uh, between the baby faces and the heels. But uh, oh, I know. In the old yeah. days, they they made a they made a point to to, to be a heel. And and, and uh, did any of them ever play any practical jokes on you or kind of stretch you around or anything? No. Uh, Back then, when I was that young, no, uh, we didn't inter inter intermingle with them. We just uh, watched them from afar. Your uncle had so much heat back then. I mean, legendary heat. I mean, when you talk about great heels, your uncle is always mentioned in that conversation. Yeah. Well, a couple things. What was he like at home? And did, when, did you notice, like, when you were out with him, were you out with him ever, when, when how people would react to him on the streets? Well, at home, he was the nicest guy in the world. Uh, you know, he, he was still, you know, uh, a man's man at home. He wasn't a sissy like, but he was very vulnerable. You know, he was very nice, to me, you know, behind the scenes. And when I got older, he wasn't that nice to me. When I started to learn how to wrestle, he wasn't that nice to me. <laughs> you know, <laughs> but uh, he was always like I always say, he's the nicest guy in the world, and the meanest guy in the world. He was so nice and so mean too, you know. And being out in public, you, I, I'd watch him afar, and you could tell he has this glow around. Him. You know, his jewelry, his suit, his tan, his, you know, his hair, everything. You could see that he was somebody, even if you didn't know who he was, you know he's somebody. You know, that's, that, that's always amazing to me. When, when, when you see somebody like that and, and you know they're, they're something special just from the way they carry themselves. And, and that, that's something that you work on. And I'm sure he worked on that, that image there. But, you know, being, being such a badass in, in, in a badass town like Detroit, I mean, you know, you, you had to be bad, but uh, his, his his demeanor about him was, you know, especially in the locker room was so nice and laid back, and he had to put on that 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 the heel of, uh, persona when he was out there. He had to turn it on. He had to turn it on, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's amazing how they could flip that switch like that. You know? Yeah. <laughs> soon as somebody with the camera, as soon as someone with the camera, he starts speaking Arabic. <laughs> <laughs> Simon, did, did you ever talk to your uncle about how he developed his character? I've always found that interesting. You know, we had, I talked to Abdullah a while back about how he developed it. Did you ever talk to him about how he developed that character? Oh, no, no, not really. He said uh, his his trainer, Bert Ruby, uh, had him be the Sheik of Araby, but only because he was Lebanese and uh, he kind of looked like an Arab, I guess. So they made him to, to be a heel only because he looked the part. But but uh, the, he was the Sheik of Araby. He was a few other things, and then the Sheik of Araby, and the, then the Sheik. You know. Did you ever, uh, or did he ever? Were they friends with Skandar Akbar? Because Akbar was Lebanese. So, uh, yes. You know, yeah. Yeah. So I guess Akbar's parents yeah, were the ones that immigrated over. You know, and Ak Akbar. That's what. Same thing happened to him. That's you know, he, he played. Uh, he fit the part, so he played the role. Right. And I think he's he's actually Lebanese also. Yeah. He is, yeah, yeah, he is. You know, grew up uh, there in Wichita Falls, and uh, you know, I, I rode with that for about a year. He was, he was Mount, like, Mount, <laughs> Mount Vernon, wasn't it? Mount Vernon, Texas. That's right, yeah, right. Us, Vernon, right. Will, Will Barker County. We used to drive by it all the way on the way to Amarillo, and oh. Agbar would always tell us about his stories. And you know, when he was a kid there, and uh, uh, I, I loved that. You know, but he always oh, had yeah. that uh, persona because he was Lebanese, and you know, it people just kind of threw it all together. Lebanese, it was all you know, uh, it was a far way away basically so were you was your uncle or you were you friends with with ak and ever discussed that with him uh discuss what i'm sorry i missed it we'll discuss the, the same similar upbringing same and everything i just i would did ak ever work with your uncle or do you ever work with ak uh I, i'm sure they did they brought us you know they talked about him a few times but i don't know i didn't have no specifics other than i think they met up with him in dallas or something like that but uh, uh he was one of, he was a brother like the rest of them you know like um Who's the guy? He's an Indian. Um, uh, Casey. Agnan now Casey. Agnan now Casey, right? yeah. Yeah, he's an Indian or Italian or something. So, <laughs> so Michael liked him because he's a real Lebanese. He, he did them all, man. Yeah, he, he had all the characters down. Yeah. He was he was a hell, hell of a shooter back in his day, too. Uh, oh, was he? From Oklahoma State and wrestled on the Iranian Olympic team and all that stuff before he came right to on. 
He actually came to America to play football. I don't know if you were aware of that, but he was no. a football. Paul Bosch brought him into the country. Uh, oh, yeah. Sponsored him. Back in those days, they had to have sponsors to come in. And Paul sponsored him to come in and actually enrolled him at the University of Houston to play football. And he didn't, he got hurt playing football and didn't like that. So he transferred to Oklahoma and became a Oklahoma State and became a wrestler up there. He was right. quite a guy. He was, he was the first quote, foreign guy I ever met in my life, but I grew up in a little hick town in Oklahoma, and uh, we didn't have a lot of foreigners compassing through there, and so, <laughs> but when I went to college there, uh, at Stillwater, he was renting a, an apartment above above one of my uh, uh, teammates' uh, house there, and I was able to meet him there, and what a fascinating, so I've known, I knew him from just about from the time I was like 12, 13 years old. But but uh, what at a, what age did you said you saw your uncle on TV? I guess you was uh, really about, about five, about five, five, five years old. Is yeah. that when you said, I want to do this? Or was you hooked right away? Uh, I was hooked right away. I, I didn't say I wanted to. It was when. You know, it was not a, a – I already had that choice made up, so it wasn't yeah. if, yeah, it was a when. Yeah. So your your brother your brothers and other other family members they had no desire to do it, Tom. No, they you know they beat me up because they're older than me, <laughs> and, and you know out wrestled me that way, but not really. They they they, they were not uh, on the wrestling team. Never wanted to be a wrestler. Thought I was crazy. Yeah. Did your uncle know you wanted to be a wrestler? Mm -hmm. From uh, since I was probably uh, what thirteen years old when I started wrestling uh, in school. But up until then, I always played, and you know I was always doing something like that. And so he he knew he knew it. He just didn't know how far I, I would, would 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 take it. You know. Did he encourage you? Did he treat you differently? What was his well, reaction? He encouraged me after I got to his house. After I got to his house, you started saying, "You can't do this. You can't do that. Got that attitude. All this stuff. No matter what I did was wrong." And 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 I could not question it. There was no why. If he said jump off the roof, I didn't say why. I, I said okay. You know. You know, the, the why didn't count. There was no why. So, yeah. but when I, before that, he was real nice to me. You're going to have a good time. But after I got out there and I couldn't get away, he started saying, okay, now, now you go to school. You know? okay. And, you know, when I was out, when I moved out to his house, uh, I, I had to get the ring from the barn, put it down in the, the courtyard by his house, by his, his office and set it up every morning and tear it down every night. For, for seven months and never get to go in and practice. Never ask him why, never ask him when or what's next. Just he goes, Turn the ring, put the ring up, I put the ring up. And at night, take the ring down, I take the ring down. In the morning, do the same thing. Did it every day, almost every day for seven months. And then finally, he let me go in the ring and work out. But I had to earn, I had to earn to get in the ring to even practice, let alone anything wow. else to learn. You know? Was this so, after high school? Was this after high yeah, school? Yeah, this was after high school. Yep. So you had to set the ring up tear it down and you weren't allowed in the ring right not allowed in it to anything, you know do anything <laughs> oh my goodness yeah. uh, I also, also also read that you know you know because you're 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 you basically evolved into a, a you know, besides the hardcore you you were a really accomplished high flyer guy could do lots of stuff. but yeah. when, you when, when you were learning you just did mat wrestling and then you know, i i heard where I, one of your interviews that you know, your your uncle wouldn't let you do any of that stuff. You were opening match and you 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 the psychology of the business at that time, opening matches went out and wrestled 10, 15 right. minutes, whatever. Right. Yeah. He, you know, I, I didn't understand it, but I did what he told I did what he told me and I, I appreciate it now. Yeah. Was it just you training with your uncle or did he have more people he was training? Uh it was mainly just me. We'd bring guys in to work out with me, or I'd go on show, go wrestle on a show, and I'd work out guy work out with guys before the show. Uh, but then Van Dam came along about five years after I started training to where I was training Van Dam. And so for seven months you just trained but didn't get in the ring. And then what no, was seven months I just got lifted weights and chopped wood and did whatever he told me to do and but not wrestle, not even talk about wrestling yet. You know, it, it was all like, uh, you know, you got to earn that if you want me to talk about it. You know, you know that's interesting because I'm a big boxing fan. Joe Lewis was big on chopping wood. And when Muhammad Ali was wanting to make a comeback, he asked him, what's the one thing to train? He said, chop wood. And Ali yeah, I... chopped, you know, <laughs> people that aren't used to that think that's crazy. But that was how a lot of the oh, old time fighters trained was chopping wood. Yeah. Yep. I think he, even yeah, even yeah. Uh, even Mike Tyson was uh, up in the Catskills up there. That's that was part of his training too, wasn't it, John? 
Absolutely. Yeah. They, they all trained that old school type, really functional training. How long did you train? Once you got in the ring, how long did you train before your first I, match? I, I trained two years. Uh, let me tell you a story. Now, uh, when I was 19, uh, I got shot. So, uh, no, no, I'm sorry. Before that, I, I'm coming up, I want to be a wrestler. Then all of a sudden, I got shot. So, it was like uh, when I got, well, you got shot. Dude, that, that's too big of a thing to just pass. I got shot. Well, you got shot in the face, shot. right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I got shot shot in the face in my shoes. But when I, as soon as I got out of the hospital, I said, I'm going to be a wrestler now. So I started lifting weights. Then I went out to my uncle's about six weeks after that. And then I moved out there a few months after that. And then it started to go. But, uh, but I, what I had, a, uh, I mean, uh, I got shot first and that kind of sparked me to do it now. Cause I kept saying, I'll do it tomorrow or, or, or next year. And, uh, it got too long. You know, I, I had to do it. So tell yeah, us how you got shot. Yeah. Uh, I was, I was at a party and, um, Something came down. These guys got in a fight. Now the corner of my eye, I seen this guy with two guns. Boom, 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 boom. Shoot my friend in the stomach, but he, he didn't get him in the stomach. It looked like he did. Boom, boom, boom. And took off running and was running with a gun behind him. And I ran up behind him, picked him up, threw him down. And when I threw him down, I came on top of him and he pushed the gun against my face right here and shot me. Wow. Wow. Got up and ran. <laughs> did, did they ever prosecute him? Uh uh, he got nine months for throwing his assault because when he turned his back, I, I kind of, I, I took it, I, I shouldn't have did that. I uh, took it up the law in my own hands when he turned his back and uh, not that I deserved to get shot, but I got shot. I, I, I did my, the reason I got shot because my, my own fault, they say, said. <laughs> during, during your training thing, uh, training uh, sessions with, with your dad, were there, did Bobo Brazil or Curry's or any of those guys ever, do you ever come in they yeah. ever hear any assistant and oh, yeah. fred, a lot of relationship curry, did you have with those guys yeah fred curry did a lot he used to train with me uh bobo didn't train with me you know he was broken up too much when i by the time i came around he was as bad as my uncle my uncle was he, he was bad. already past his prime at that time man. oh yeah yeah the chic when i came around he was way past his prime he had two bad hips and uh, he could hardly walk you know and, but, and uh, i saw but, bobo other... wasn't much better the age difference was dramatic. I mean, the Sheik, I saw one thing where you said the Sheik, when he was 59, you were 21. So there was a, I mean, he was, he was when way he was past. When he was 59, I was 19. Wow. Dude. So he was, he's I mean, he was as old as I am now. <laughs> right, right. That's right. That's it. We but know the feeling. I, I seen him. He was such a in bad shape. His hips, he had to get two hip replacements at the same time. He could hardly move. And he still tried to work sort of. But then after a few months of that, we got his hip fixed. But uh, he, he was a tough bastard. And when he started working, you started working for him, right? Uh, no, uh, working for the Bear Man in Ontario. When I came around, there was no more companies. Uh, um, uh, I refereed, refereed a few matches for him, but never wrestled for him. Because uh, when I came, there was, the wrestling fizzled away. So he had me wrestling in Canada for the first two years. And uh, you know, it was called Big Time Wrestling. It's like his, but, but it was from Dave the Bear Man. And you who were some, who was some of the talent up there you were competing in? What's that? Who was who was some of the talent you were competing with up in, up in Canada? Uh, Chris Cole, uh, Joey War Eagle, uh, Jimmy Valiant, Johnny Valiant. I mean, um, Adonis was up there for a little, little while. Um, Kevin Sullivan, Mark Lewin. My first few matches was with Kevin Sullivan. Now, now you mentioned you mentioned RVD in your in your early training uh, sessions. There, did you guys kind of form a friendship at that early age or what? Oh yeah, because I, that was five years after I was wrestling when I met him. So I was ready to be still. I still wanted to top myself. I was ready to expand. So when he came in, I kind of gave him a fast job on how to work, and then said, "Now let's learn from each other. <laughs> now you teach me." And your first gimmick had nothing to do. I mean, you you, you didn't. Uh, I guess you did deny the association with the Sheik, which which a lot of old promoters. Yeah, yeah no, did. nobody knew I was his nephew. I was called Terry Sr. I, I don't know what the Sr. means because he's never <laughs> told me. <laughs> he never told me, and he goes, "It doesn't matter because no one's gonna know about it five. Remember it five years from now. You know, no one's supposed to remember those years. My first five years, those didn't exist. You know how it is. But uh, but uh, the, he named Terry Sr. and that doesn't Terry nobody. Uh, mind your own business first match <laughs> and, and then, then when did the well most of the time boys didn't know i was his nephew so like he would he would yell at me a little bit and, and tell me to do shit and then they would say man the sheep don't like you 
you know, but you know, he's scolding me, you know. And, and, and when, and, when know, did the Sabu character first come around? Um, a, a, after five years, he, he named me Sabu the Elephant Boy. And uh, uh, it's when I dropped the Elephant Boy. Uh, the Elephant Boy is, is, a, is, I didn't like the name because nobody understood it, but the Elephant Boy is like a cowboy. You heard elephants, like in India. Would be Sabu the, the cowboy with elephants, elephant boy. But not, no one understood it, and I didn't want him to. You know, I didn't like the elephant boy part, so I just dropped it. And where would when you first created the Sabu character, what did you talk about with the with the Sheik? What what was the uh, conversation as far as the creative? Uh, well, when he wasn't around, um, I would act natural the way I do now. But when he was around, I did everything straight. Just like him, you know, brought, you know, big chest sticking out and everything the way you're supposed to. But when he wasn't around, I kind of relaxed and started bending myself. So he started saying, he said, now do that, you know, you know, the, the, be yourself now. And, and I was moving the way I felt. I, I wasn't thinking about it, you know. Did, did, when, did, you, ever, did, did you ever team up with your, your uncle or, or now? Did yeah, I yeah my, my first trip to Japan was a tag team tournament. We were there uh, like 21 matches in a row. Wow. What year was that? Uh, 91. 91, 92. 91. Who was that with? Was that with FMW? Oh, Anita. Uh, FMW. And that's that's when Anita had just started, right? Uh, it was about a year or so after you started. It, it was my first trip there, but they were running about a year before I got there. When, did Were you just good at hardcore, or when you saw it, did you thought, did you think that's something well, I want to do? Well, Onita's, you know, they, they always had one street fight at the end of the show, which is a hardcore match where you fight all over the place. And so every, you know, uh, every now and then I would be in one of those matches. So they they go, okay, today is no style. There's no Japanese style. There's no Mexican style. There, there's just a fight. And so that's what it kind of was. But but I tried to incorporate wrestling into the the, the, the brutal the brutal fight, you know. Like well, did, did, did you have anybody that you kind of modeled after or did was you innovating no. as you went? You were just a... No. And like when I first started doing my stuff, well, when I went to Japan, I wrestled like everybody else. My first match there, me and my uncle getting ready to go out. I go, Sheik, what do you want me to do tonight that's different? You know, I can't I can't wrestle like a first match guy. We're fucking, you know, 15,000 people out there. Then he goes, wrestle like you think I'm not watching. I go, what do you mean? He goes, you know what I mean? When you think I'm not watching and jumping around in the ring, I was watching. So I want you to do that stuff. That was my uh, backflips and all that stuff. You know, so I, I started wrestling this the way I, in FMW, did whatever I felt like, and, and everything was right. You know, you know a lot you, of times you couldn't call the match because the guys were Japanese, but uh, as they stay or move, they understood it. Did you wait, learn wait. that? You know, Jerry asked the question a, a little bit, kind of. I want to just kind of follow up that. Did you did you pick anything from it with a high flying style that you created? Was there anybody that you looked at and thought I kind of want to be like that, or I yes, want to do yes. this, or I want to take part of that style? Yeah, I wanted to be like Tiger Mask. I remember because um, sure. my uncle said, uh, you know, I want you to pattern your wrestling style after three guys you think are great. You know, so I said, well, one was Jimmy Snuka, one was a Sheik, and one was Tiger Mask. That's a pretty good threesome. <laughs> well, it is. I mean, it makes perfect sense to me. I mean, I, I can see all three in your in your style. It, it makes perfect sense. And what a what a great thing to tell a young guy to pattern themselves after three superstars that you want to be like. Right. Yeah. You know, because Hanson took a lot from uh, Jeet Singh as far as the entrance. You know, there was all very oh, kinetic, yeah. a lot of energy. You know, Hanson wanted uh -huh. to emulate that. You know, but keep that going for the entire match. You know, so it's. Everybody has somebody that they look after and kind of start their career yeah, modeling yeah. Like, after. Uh, then, then you kind of said, he said, imitate those three guys in your mind. Don't tell anybody, don't tell anybody you imitate them because you look stupid. So just I, when you imitate those guys in your mind, uh, that's you. Did Did you ever have any crossings with uh, uh, the Jeets uh, that sings uh, Tiger? And yeah, yeah. I, I did a couple of tours with them. Yeah. Uh, you had what, a couple of tours in Japan or what? Yeah, yeah. Yep. He, he's a pushy guy. He's no fun to be around. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I know what you're talking about. <laughs> yeah. Fun at all. <laughs> yeah, I was with him a couple tours also. So. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. He was too much for me. <laughs>
He, uh, he was, he was a, hey, he was a huge name in the seventies and early eighties. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. 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 No, yeah. I can't take that from him. Uh, no, no, no. I, you know, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. We're saying the same thing. Yeah. Right. <laughs> hey, what the, I saw a match that you had the fire match where damn near everybody died. <laughs> what, <laughs> what happened? Uh, that was a mistake. The, the, the fire was too hot. <laughs> the fire was too hot. We couldn't do the match inside the ring. It just got too hot. And my uncle got burned. But I, I didn't get burned, but he did. <clears throat> because uh, when it, when I jumped out of the ring, he crawled. So when he crawled, the fire was still hooked to the ropes. You know, so it got close to his back. The mindset going into one of those matches. I mean, I I've never even. Um, they didn't before. even. I, can't I, even don't, I don't even know what you're had... thinking there. How did how did that? How did a fire match come to existence? Tell me. <laughs> I don't even think they advertised it. It was all one. All of a sudden, one day they go, "Tomorrow's a fire match." I said, "Yeah, right." <laughs> and then th tomorrow was a fire match. I mean, from no what? what? What did it evolve from? I mean, what, what I, I'm it? not sure. I'm not sure. Uh, nothing really, other than uh, the Sheik versus Onita. Yeah. You know, but you know that's uh, one of those crazy things where some booker just says, "Hey, let's set the ring on fire." And, and <laughs> well, so, you know, everything's done in Japanese there, so we didn't know what the angle they were doing. We had no idea. Fire match. You said that. I never heard that. And was your, was your man the first first uh, Bob Bar matches too, or you had yes. a bit? Yeah. yeah, yeah. What do you think when they when when they finally said, "Hey, you know, we're gonna have a Bob Bar match," and then yeah. the next side, "Hey, we're gonna have a Bob Bar match. We're gonna set the damn thing on fire." <laughs> My second tour of FMW, I had a one barbed wire match. And uh, I go, okay, cool, that's fine. One one out of 100 or one at one a year. And then the following tour, I had two of them. And I go, hey, this is getting my hand a little bit. The following tour, I had like four. Finally, I had 15 barbed wire matches out of 16 matches. Wow. I go, why am I in the barbed wire, everybody? They go, because you love it. I go, no, no, I don't. Because you love it. <laughs> yeah, because they thought I loved it. I said, no, I don't. I just try to hire that whatever I'm faced with and uh, act like I like it. And I don't like it. You know, I was getting all cut up every night and, you know, infections and shit. Brother, how do you how do you keep safe in one of those things? I mean, I just can't imagine. Uh, because that, those things are sharp. <laughs> yeah. You, you go, like, when you get, if you take a bump into it, you, got, you come out the same way. If you come out sideways, it rips you. So my first barbed wire match, I came out sideways, ripping around, thinking I'm not going to have another one forever. You know, I didn't know I was going to have them all the time. So I, I ripped out of them and I got cut up pretty bad in my first barbed wire match. But after that, I learned uh, you, you can go into the barbed wire, pull yourself out. It doesn't hurt as much. You know what? A lot of people don't realize now because they do some stuff, some stuff like that now. Nothing as crazy as that. But, you know, when we first started and I, I didn't have to, I didn't do anything as crazy as that. There was no blueprint for what we were doing right you know, there was there was no hey this is how you be safe there was no stunt coordinator I mean, right. it hadn't been done before and so when you're doing stuff they're like uh, yeah just try to figure it out you know <laughs> try to figure it out <laughs> what are you stuck in that bob bar trying to figure out how to get, get out so, of there? before the my first bob wire match they showed me a bob wire match on the video so i kind of knew what, what they were going to do and what they they were doing was just walking up to the bob wire and rubbing their head on it and screaming so i said i'm not gonna do that you know i'm gonna be better than that so so i everything i did kind of tapped them because i every, every i can make it through them to the barbed wire they'd walk real slow and then lean on the barbed wire and then scream you know i said what the fuck so i i would hit the barbed wire and uh you know do some athletic stuff to it wow <laughs> so that they confused that with loving it i was just trying to, <laughs> I was just trying to get right. paid there's a big difference in being good at it and liking it yeah. right exactly and there's all oh, he's good at it so let's just put him in a bar bar every, every single night yeah this, this sounds kind of tame after bar bars and explosion but how in the hell did table hook can get involved in these things um well fmw and the street fights they would power bomb guys through a table and, and pile drive them through it and, and hit them with the table because it was a light table so uh, one time uh, after the match, my uncle said, get back in there and get your heat. I go, what do you want to do? He goes, think of something. And I looked around the ring, and because we were tagging, I seen a table. I said, how about I move off the table? He goes, what's that? I go, I'll show you. And then uh, it took off from there. Yeah. And, uh, that Japanese table is a little bit stiffer than an American table, too. Uh, no, not really. They're smaller. They're hard, it's smaller. a harder target to hit. Yeah, people think they're stiff. They're not. The hollow, they're nothing. It's like a, a, a hollow door. Yeah. 
<laughs> but the thing is, that it's 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 only about a foot wide. I need like four feet for error. Uh, and one thing I saw, and we had uh, RBD on our show, who was the same thing. I mean, when you guys were against each other, it was just it was just kind of a you know. Sometimes you come across a perfect matchup, and, and to me, that was just a perfect matchup with you two guys in there. You guys did things that people haven't still haven't been able to figure out how to do, you know, because you guys were great athletes and great workers. But one thing was the psychology was, you know, RBD would talk about how he would put a chair down the next week. He'd put two chairs down. Then he put three, but you know, you're you're building to something. You talk about that a lot in a lot of our interviews about the fact that you didn't just walk down with a table or pull a table out from under the ring. There was a reason for everything you did there actually was there actually was you know and uh i would get frustrated when they go with well, the tables under the ring and ah can't you put that ring side no 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 the tables under the ring. fuck i couldn't fight anymore but uh yeah uh i didn't like how they're like every every time i broke a table it vince goes to me boom 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 break a table i said how about i set it up like this that the other thing and then break the table he goes no just break it i said come on how about i do like this that the other thing and he goes, no, just break it. I said, okay. So I went to match and did this, that, the other thing where it was like, I, I set it up, stop, teased it, teased it, crash. No, it wasn't just a crash. I, I always have to have one or two teases to, to make it, you know, add a little drama to it. Yeah. And it's not like, you know, I, I don't want to bash, you know, I'm not I'm one of those, every generation bashes the new generation. And I, right. I, I certainly don't want to be that. I, you know, cause I, I don't, cause this generation is awesome. Uh, but the first ladder match with Shawn Michaels and Razor, they didn't oh, advance yeah. the ladder for eight minutes into the match. You know, it was all, it was all Shakespeare up till then. Now they do a ladder match, and the first thing they do is climb the ladder and do Boom. some <laughs> <laughs> Just, jumping out of the rafters. Which God bless them, they're great athletes, but it's a lot of times it doesn't. There's not a reason. I, I I almost refuse to do a match like that. If I have to do it like that, I refuse it. Try to refuse it. If I have to, have to, then I will. But if there's any way I can stop it, I always try or to change it. I mean, because a lot, a lot of times they'll say, you know, other promoters say, just break a table, just get it in. That not that what you want to do? I go, no, I want to lead up to it, tease, tease, and then break the table. So I don't have to do a giant table bump. I can do a medium one because they're happy to see it. <laughs> right. Now, you, you're yeah. traveling back and forth to Japan quite a bit. Uh, uh, where, where did you have a home base? Was it out of Detroit? Was you working in Detroit in between, or was you just basically working Japan? Uh, I was working uh, uh, Japan and ECW and Japan and uh, Independence, but I I actually married a Japanese broad and I lived there for a little while. How, how, did, how did the how did the uh, <laughs> the the uh, the, uh, the the Japan award where you ECW how did that how did that come about did you meet somebody in Japan or what? No, um, I was doing my thing in Japan for about like two years, and then uh, Paul Heyman called or Todd Gordon called me, the owner of ECW, said, "Do you want to come in?" I go, "Yeah," and I, he brought me in. And Paul E didn't even know I was going to be there. It was Paul E's first day. And well, where, first where did Todd hear from me from? I mean, uh, the the dirt sheets, you know, uh, the Meltzer sheets. Yeah, they're big, big fans of that. Right. So back then, that's all they got was the sheets. Right. They thought it was like the Bible. Was after was you was you getting any coverage from after or anything over in Japan? Uh, yeah, a little bit. Uh, but but not as much as on the the, the dirt sheets. Right. Uh, and 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 Todd Gordon and Paul, they didn't they only read the dirt sheets. Yeah, over being over in Japan, one of the, one of the biggest thrills I think ever ever American wrestler has is the. The been on in those in those Japanese magazines there. What was oh, the yeah. Japanese magazine? They they were pretty hot at your time because I know I went yeah. back in but my day that was that was yeah, a big they, deal to be in the Japanese magazine. So you yeah, you were getting they, a lot of coverage in those, right? Oh yeah. Uh they get they have two magazines a week but come out. I think they still have two. And uh their their magazines are like TV because it comes out each week. Yeah, it's unbelievable. It's hard to explain to people that didn't know that didn't work in Japan how important those magazines were. They yeah. told the whole story. Oh yeah. Yeah. And their photographers were so good. You know, they always caught the right moment. Maybe they took a thousand photographs. I don't know, but they, they right, right. got the right moment. They put it in the the magazines told a story. It really could get right. you over. Yeah. So when, when I, was always, I was always friends with a magazine guy, so he put me over. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. I, I do. I, I, that's why I, I was taught right from the very beginning. Be friends. These guys there, they do you a lot of favors, you know. <laughs> right. Yeah. You know, so. What, what did your uncle ever say during this time? You're starting to make a big name for yourself in Japan. You're doing all this innovative stuff. 
you're becoming as big a name as he is already. What did your uncle say to you during this time? Did he ever like criticize you? Did he ever critique you? Did he ever talk to you about it? No, he would say, they're going to tone you down. I go, no, they're not. Goes, yeah, they are. They're going to try to tone you down and give it to somebody else. And he was right. They're, you know, uh, when I was in WWE, I couldn't even do my own bumps. I said, I'm not, can I break a table tonight? No. This other guy's going to do it in my match. You go, fuck. All right. How about a chair? No. Nope. So-and-so's going to do it. I go, like, those are moves I invented. They go, not here you didn't. You know, so I was frustrated. You know, uh, I couldn't do the moves I invented. I couldn't do them. Uh, I don't know what I was getting at. I forgot. <laughs> Talk about your uncle. When did your uncle your uncle said to tone you down? I was asking. Oh yeah, uncle. he goes, they'll, they'll tone you down and give it to somebody else. You know, and uh, he, you know that's pretty much what they did. Okay. Like they had me pass the torch, but they didn't let me pass it. They ripped it out of my hand. They, they took it out before I was ready to give it to them. Right. So when when Ty Gordon finally contacted you, you made the move to uh, to to uh, uh, ECW. Paul Paul was aware of who you were from from the magazine and a dirt sheet basically. There because yeah. Paul was a big dirt sheet guy. And right. so did, did, did he try to tone you down or did you come in as a wild man or how did no, he, he he said, do, Yeah. He said, do whatever you want. And, and I did it and I, it worked. Yeah. You know, Sabu, everybody no. that it's been around a while, you know, has their favorite opponents. You know, I get to wrestle Eddie Guerrero a lot, you know, and he was, you know, him and, and Undertaker are probably my two, you know, favorite opponents. Jerry uh -huh. had, uh, you know, the Briscoes had the funks. Uh, you had oh, yeah. several, but one of them was RVD. When you first got in the ring with him, did you feel like this is magic? Uh, well, no, because of, when I got in the ring with him the first time, he, he didn't know how to headlock. He, he didn't know he didn't have any sinks of a wrestler. He did know boxing or kickboxing and tough man competition, but no hand to hand grappling. So you know, so I couldn't really tell if he was going to be anything at the, the beginning. You know, I knew he had the heart, but he was skinny, uh, good looking kid, skinny. Too, you know, if I was to look at him, I'm saying he's too skinny. You know, but now he's twice my size. <laughs> but uh, when I first met him, no. After about three or four weeks, I knew. And you know, when, when you came to ECW, time. was that the first time you got matched up with him on a on a big stage? Uh, on a big stage, yeah. I wrestled him once or twice here and there, uh, but that was the first time I wrestled him on a, a real platform. After you guys trained together, you guys didn't have any competition to, with each other up, up in, in the Northeast? Uh, North no, North. not really. You know, yeah. it was always uh, my uncle always taught me to help. You know, yeah. and so we taught Rob. We, no matter what we do, we're going to help each other. Yeah. No matter what happens, we'll still help each other. Yeah. You know, during that time, Sabu, uh, they had that great match with uh, Two Cold Scorpio and Chris Benoit down in WCW, and everybody saw it. And thought, oh my God, this is unbelievable. But the other two guys that were doing things that nobody could do was you and and RVD. And you're doing it every night and you're doing more stuff. I mean, that, that just happened on, on, you know, out of the blue in, in a, in a TV show that didn't have that kind of stuff. Right. You guys were doing it every single night. Did you realize yeah, at the can't. time how far ahead of everybody else that you were? Um, no, no, I was just, you know, taking it night by night. You know, you're just wrestling, uh, right? Yeah, yeah. You're just having fun. Turn it up. Like uh, uh, it was it was almost a dream come true. If we would have got paid, it would have been the best job in the world. But since we didn't get paid, <laughs> uh, it, it, it was lacking a little bit. <laughs> well, I saw that you turned down WWE for uh, Paul uh, Heyman because you gave me your word, right? Yeah. I yeah. Know. Well, that, that yeah wasn't very enthusiastic here. <laughs> yeah, they wanted me to do a Royal Rumble in like '96 or something, and. Uh, uh, Paul used to just tell him no. So I said, fuck. So I told him no. Was, where where it, were you working mainly at that at 96 when they went ahead proposed it? Um, uh, Japan. Japan, yeah. Yeah. And then when uh, you ended up progressing and you had some, some of those great matches with Taz and all that stuff, what what was your thoughts of ECW at the time? Did you think that this company was, you know, because at that time you had that big competition. All right, it was just kicking off between WWE and WCW, but ECW was still there drawing good crowds and incredibly passionate crowds. What did you think about ECW at the time? Did you think it was going to make it? Did you think that you guys were going to compete with WWE, WCW? What was your thoughts? I really thought we were, we were going to make it. Uh, I always tell people my favorite match of probably all times is the first match I had with Taz in uh, ECW. 
you know, the very first match before my, no, those people never seen me before that. The poly didn't see me before that. Nobody seen me before that. And then we did this match and, and that's what started everything out. The ECW wasn't like, oh, we're going to be extreme tomorrow. It was, it turned into that. You know, yeah, yeah, we'll get into that a little bit. Coming. It was just Eastern Championship Wrestling. Did yeah. you you were kind of responsible for turning it into the extreme wrestling, right? right. But but the, yes, but Polly gets the credit as in of course, of course. But the, it, tell, but, tell us about it, it really happened. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, I give him credit for letting us do our thing, but he didn't come up with it. You know, <laughs> yeah, yeah, uh, he didn't come up with it, but he let us do our thing. Yeah. Nobody told, what, said, okay, Sabu, so this tonight. They didn't do that. I just did my thing and Paul, Paul shit himself. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Jim, did, right? Jim Crockett was there. I, I was doing a, 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 a Polly and Jim Crockett was there because Jim Crockett was going to invest in something, but he ended up not doing it. Really? I didn't know that. I didn't know that Jim Crockett was going to get, get back into it. Yeah, uh, he was there in the dressing room. Wow. Interesting. So, hey, to go back to something, I, I forgot to ask. Uh, there's always been speculation about uh, your your uncle and Vince. You know, whether they liked each other, didn't like each other, what all went on. There's all kinds of legends, of, you know, about what went on, what didn't go on. I don't think anybody knows the truth except for maybe you. So, what was the relationship with your uncle and, and Vince when when Vince is ended up taking over territories and things like that? He, as far as I know, he hated Vince because uh, when I had a meeting with Vince. Uh, I go, my uncle's going to kill me if he finds out I'm here because he hates your guts. And, he, and that's what I said to Vince. And Vince goes, I don't know why Eddie would hate my guts. I said, probably because you put him out of business. I was thinking that. <laughs> <laughs> out of business, fuck. Okay. <laughs> but, uh, yeah. Um, so you're, uncle, you're, uncle, you're, uh, that's what I always heard. I always heard that, that, that I don't know if I heard Vince. Then I knew, I heard your uncle did not like Vince. Yeah, but my, my uncle didn't like Vince, but. Uh, Vince said, I don't know why he wouldn't like me, but, but he knows why. He knows what he did. Uh, what do I know? You know? <laughs> Damn right. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> so, so you and Taz, you and Taz were, were magic uh, combinations. They're just like RVD. And you, you have so many, you, you had so many rivals there at the time, with, even going uh, a little bit later on with Terry Funk there. But Taz, Taz's style and your style, did you kind of convert back or were you, were you or did you start to? doing the really extreme stuff with Taz or was it still the suplexes and, a, and a stuff like that? Um, he was doing the suplexes. I was doing the extreme stuff. Taz changed slowly into a, a wrestling machine. Before that, he was like a, a, a caveman or a, you know, a, a Tasmaniac. Oh boy, he, he he fit the role there, whichever style <laughs> he, he fit the role. He, he was awesome. I, I always make fun of him so he looks like Barney Rubble. Did you have great <laughs> obviously you had great good. chemistry with him too, right? Yeah, yeah, we had good chemistry. Yeah. Anytime you can get a Flintstone reference in on somebody, it's good. <laughs> <laughs> I love <Yeah>. that. <laughs> That's one of those references where somebody calls you that or something, you go, I hope that doesn't stick around because I don't like that. <laughs> <laughs> right. That's funny. So during that time with ECW, did, did you when did you start seeing that ECW was probably not going to be the one that that made it uh, out of this? Uh, not see the one, not see them. Yeah, yeah. Well, you, because you guys were, I mean, you guys were on fire. I mean, absolutely on fire. I remember I did. Well, I can't remember which one of the one night stands. I've never been in front of a crowd like that. It was oh, awesome. Yeah. First it was so much fun to be in front of that crowd. And, it was incredibly passionate. I always thought NXT, like when it first kicked off, was like ECW, but a PG version. You know, you had a very uh, passionate kind of underground movement uh, that was right kind on. of similar, you know, in certain ways. But you had this incredible passionate following. When did you start seeing that it looks like that there's going to be maybe one winner out of this and ECW probably is not going to be that? Uh, I, I was just wishful thinking. When I went into the very first, I knew it wasn't going to hold on. You know, uh, Vince didn't like what we did. I don't know why he put up with it. You know, because when we had have matches, there would there would be no extreme matches on a whole on a whole show, not even one. And most of the people who was used to ECW, we had almost every match an extreme match. And I don't agree with that. But we need at least one no rules match on the show. And we'd go shows with no no rules or no uh, no hardcore matches, no tables, no chairs. You know, not even the one match. 
That's because of this story. Because I think trying to kill it on purpose. Yeah, you you or John mentioned. I'm not sure which one it was, but they brought up the fans. They were they were such an important part of ECW. I think they they really enhanced the product there. Uh, what, what do you think the, the the passion grew from? Just just you guys as extreme style and different style, or, or what made what made that fan base so different than the average average pro wrestling fan base? Because we acknowledged them, we didn't ignore them. When they gave us a, a chair, we took that chair and used it. When, when you know we made them part of the show, or audience <laughs> Yeah, we, we made them part of the show. They, we, we didn't ignore them because they they know rest, what wrestling is. But but you know WWE chooses to kayfabe. That, that was back then. You know, uh, put them on the outside where where they don't the only way they hear anything is if you if you can see them in dirt sheets. But uh, you know, we made the fans part of our show. And in your fans, where well, your fans travel all over the country, basically with you guys, too, right? Sometimes, yeah. <laughs> Sometimes, uh, uh. you know what tells you how important the brand was is when you see it, uh, somebody do something now, you still hear what 20 something years after ECW, the, the real ECW folded or, or quit uh, operating, you still hear the fans chant ECW. Oh, yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. You know, you don't hear that from uh, Texas wrestling, Florida wrestling, you know, Memphis, right. uh, you but you hear it from ECW, which is what tells you how important that brand was to so many people. Right. Exactly and that's right. got to make you feel great that you did something that made a difference in people's lives. So, you know, yeah. I say make a difference. I mean, a lot of people say, I grew up watching you or I grew up doing this. And it, it really is cool when you, it, it has to be cool for you to be able to hear stuff like that. Yeah, it is cool. It's very cool. You know, the, the me appreciated 20 years later, you know, still being appreciated. And the and, and strange thing about that is, Sabu, most of the kids that are chanting now weren't even around for the original product. So it's <laughs> that's like, right. It's that's right. Right. So watching you and Taz and RVD and the other guys that was resting their bodies every night, well, watching videos of them. So it's evergreen uh, for forever and ever, I think, just the style that you guys did. That, that's, a, that's a great feeling. Yeah, it is. You worked with uh, John Cena uh, at one of the shows, and uh, you know, I, I, I personally, I like Cena. You know, and people, uh, you know, I, I don't know how he can be underrated when you're 16 time world <laughs> champion, but for some reason, he seems to be underrated. I saw an interview you did that you enjoyed working with him. Oh yeah, he was uh, better than everybody said he was, and he was more gracious than that I could imagine. But he he was he was very good. I thought he was very good. And you also mentioned another one of my favorites, and and uh, you said the same thing I've said about it for years. Thank God he's friendly. Is Big Show because if he wasn't friendly, he'd kill us all. <laughs> oh, he'd kill you. Oh yeah, he would kill you if he can't work. He would kill you. Oh my goodness, he told me one time because I'm I'll pick you up over my head. We're backstage, and, and I said, "Well, how are you gonna do that?" Because not because he wasn't strong enough, but because I'm long. You know, it's hard to pick up. You know, a long guy. And he goes like this, and he picked me up backstage. I'm like, oh my god, this is a giant, a real giant. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and he yeah. played the role so well. You had to love that because the contrast in styles, contrast in styles to me make matches. You know, when you got two big guys, it's usually terrible. People always want to see the two big guys go at it until they go at it. No, well, they do. <laughs> <laughs> and and then you realize I didn't really want to see that. <laughs> But the yeah, small I like, guy like you, I, I flies and like, flies and flies, that's, that's the kind of matchup that you want. Yeah, Big Show was one of my favorite guys to work. I, I liked working him. Yeah. When he didn't crush me, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so the run after, so when when you came back to WWE, did, did did you enjoy that run or did you were you happy you came back? No, I didn't enjoy it. No. You just felt limited, right? Well, yeah, you know. And you were, and you guys like, were. I mean, I'll I'll speak up. And say I, I felt like a sellout. It felt like uh, you know I was trying to do it their way, and it, and it didn't work. You know. Yeah, yeah. It just goes back to you know what I, what I said earlier about the fan base. You gave the fans what they wanted, and 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 when you were with, with WWE, you were, you were held back and restricted a lot, and uh, and you know you yeah. they were the same product, and when when you tried to come up with a cheaper product and and what are not cheaper, but a, a, a downgraded product, it, it's not going to be the same. And and your fan base was so passionate and wanted what what they'd seen before. I think you guys were hindered, and I, I don't think it's any fault of the talent at all. Well, 
If it was, it was because of Vince too. <laughs> Talent had Vince. <laughs> Yeah, it was just a different idea that, you know, WCW didn't work in, in WWE. You know, they, they brought in WCW and it, you right. know, it, it didn't work either. You know, it just, it, it, it's hard to stay true to an evasion angle when the company owns both both sides. <laughs> yeah, yeah. See, though, ECW was only WWE with three different letters. It was the same old thing. You know, right. And that's what I was there. I was there at the time. And I remember that you guys running the shows and that's exactly what I thought at the time is that that's just us running uh, shows over there. Talk about us, WWE running right, shows right. over there with ECW guys who are now WWE guys, you know, it just, you know, you lived off of it for a while because ECW was such a strong brand, but you got to give the people what they want out of that brand. But see, I didn't know Paul Heyman was talking to Vince from almost the beginning of ECW. I didn't know that. You know, Polly was a double agent. <laughs> For years, he's always been double agent. <laughs> Paul, Paul, Polly, I mean, it must have been, I mean, you know, back during his peak of his creative time. And Paul, Paul now has evolved into one of the greatest uh, mouthpieces of oh, all yeah. time. Of all time. <laughs> and, and, you know, back and back when he was and living in the danger zone with WCW, I, I saw what talent that guy had, man, and and watched him progress from there. But uh, when he he even Paul, I think Paul accepted the fact that he had to tone himself down a little bit. But you know, but he he did work wide, but but on on the mic he's still as good as they come, and as good, probably one of the best in the history. There, did you did you did you notice that in in the beginning when you went when first went to WCW with this guy? He's sharp as hell. He's sharper. Oh yeah, hell. yeah, yeah. I because when I first came into ECW, of course, he made me. He he made I made him my manager. Well, he he made me his client. I didn't pick him. <laughs> he was, you know, he's, he was smart about that. You know? Yeah. So, so from yeah, day yeah, one, he's had the best clients there is. I mean, he <laughs> pick of the litter. Well, he's got good eye for talent. He looks out there and sees the best best talent that there is. He hey, he's gonna be mine. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yeah. But that's also and after a while, it's a self fulfilling gimmick. You know, if you're only with world champions, then eventually that's all you're with. Yeah. Right. Yeah. You know, they don't, they won't take a chance on somebody trying to rise up. You know, that occasionally they will, but, you know, not very often and not very long if it doesn't work. Uh, you know, we, we talked a little bit about all this participation there. Was, was there ever any time that, that it went south, it went bad on you guys, you know? And, and man, what know, happened? Yeah, of course. A lot of things. You know, a lot of times, like uh, when I wrestled ben, Benoit, he threw me up and I broke my neck in like the first two minutes of the match. Wow. You know, a lot of things went bad. Uh, and you finished uh, the match, right? I, I, oh, yeah. No, I didn't. That time I did. I was hurt too much. Wow. I, I, could, I couldn't get up. But, uh, you know, I, I, I tore my bicep and, uh, you know, finished the match. It got 150 stitches in it afterwards. Wow. You know, that, that, that was pretty, pretty heavy. What I what I was going at were there ever any times where 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 a fan got a little too too uh, knowledgeable of the business came in and he ended up getting thrown out of a window or anything like that? <laughs> <laughs> not not by me, by other guys. Not by me. other guys. Yeah. Who 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 were the enforcers in in ECW at that time? Uh, this guy Big Dick Dudley. Yeah. Yeah, he he was a big bouncer for our company. Yeah. For the dressing room, actually, Tommy Rich too. Tommy Rich used to beat up guys for us. Yeah. Really? Wildfire. Yeah. 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 He used to meet up guys. Yeah. Like in the outside the dressing room in the parking lot. I I I I heard I heard an interview or read, I can't remember which one it was, but at uh, at the at the hotel you guys stayed at all the time. He had a he had a room with a dead body in it, or you had a room with yeah, a dead we, we did. Now, tell uh, us we... a little bit about that. <laughs> <laughs> um the, the, uh, the it was called the travel lodge. Uh, in Philadelphia, and all the rooms are full. They said, oh, we have this one room, but you, you might not want it. I said, well, I'll take it. So I so I went up there and found it, and it was a, a big old blood stain and a chalk outline of the body. <laughs> we just put a blanket over it, and then uh, went out just as usual. <laughs> put the comforter over it. <laughs> and that was, the thing was, that was before there was cameras. You know, no one had a camera back then. Right, right. Well, Sand Sandman died a couple times in ECW, right? Oh yeah, at that same hotel, not in that room. Same hotel. hotel. That might have been him on the chalk. Was it his chalk marker? 
That might have been. Well, did have a drink in his hand, so I wasn't him. So I tell you, <laughs> yeah, he had a chalk yeah. line with a drink in it. Yeah, he 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 uh he died in that hotel, I think twice. No, just once. The other one, he died on the out on the highway. <laughs> <laughs> Between hotels. <laughs> yeah, yeah, by choice or by uh... not by accident. Uh, uh, yeah, by accident. And he used to say, your... like, no matter what we did, he goes, I can do twice that. I said, but it's not a contest and it's expensive. Well, he did twice it. Um, Oxy's shooting them up and uh, he went to pull the side of the road and pump, pump his heart until the animals jump. <laughs> out of all out of all the uh, extreme matches you had, which was your least favorite and which was your favorite? Uh, my favorite would be uh, when I had Terry Funkin at Barbed Wire match uh, and, and for ECW. And my least favorite, um, the Benoit match. Been long, that's why I got the neck. You know, you know, he broke my neck in November. Then I wrestled him again in February in Japan, and he broke my shoulder. <laughs> wow. Yeah. wow! Wow! And so uh, you, you, you uh, Terry, broke... Funk. Terry, Terry, we all we all love Terry, and we all respect Terry, and we all miss Terry. Great, grateful to Terry was, was a yeah. great friend of mine. Uh, he, he, you know, for him to be involved in that, it was just so weird to me, you know, but it was just a different personality at Terry that I knew he had, but to see him do it, it just, you know, it was just, just weird. It, it had to be kind of weird for you guys, too, to get in the ring and see Terry Funk over there doing all this stuff. Well, he was the first guy of his stature in wrestling and age that would let me do my stuff. Yeah. You know, everybody else is you doing that shit with me. And so I didn't do shit with him. Only if you allowed me. Terry Funk says, let's see it. So I did. And then he and started, doing it. It. started stealing, he started stealing my moves. <laughs> <laughs> doing moonsaults and shit. But yeah, he's the first guy. He opened the door. After that, everybody started letting me do it. Yeah. They go, Terry Funk can do it. Yeah. You literally wrestled all over the world. I mean, I was reading some of the places and some of the titles you won and some of the some of the matches you had, you literally was all over the world. You know, back back in Lansing, what Lansing, Michigan. Do you ever think yes. that, man? I'm gonna I'm gonna be a world traveler like that. And it had to be a thrill for you to get out like that. Oh, it's definitely a thrill. Um, no, I didn't think about world traveling. I when I dreamt about wrestling, I didn't I didn't know about the traveling part. <laughs> you know, I just thought well, you go to the Lansing City Center every week and you wrestle. You know. Yeah, you know, I, I, I also read where you you really didn't go to Cobo Hall, which was a no, uh, they go wrestling that much. No, not Cobo because that that was eighty miles away, and we had our own Cobo Hall, Nancy. You know, sort of. Yeah. Cobo was the really, Cobo was the Saturday show, right? Um. Yes, because Sunday was off. And then was that was that the big show of the week, Cobo? Oh yeah. Uh, you did get to work there one time with your uncle, though, right? Yeah, um, in WCW, yeah, or NWA, yeah, I think it was. Yeah, it was for Dust, Dusty and Kevin Sullivan and the Sheik and somebody else. Can't remember who. No, it was the Sheik and Kevin. Oh, Murdoch and Murdoch and Dusty Rhodes against Kevin and the Sheik. Wow. <laughs> and what, a, what a great tag team match. Yeah. And you and uh, broke your uncle's leg one time, right? Oh fuck yeah! <laughs> <laughs> Not on purpose, believe me. I, I hated myself for it. Uh, you know, I did a man, um, Halloween Havoc for WCW, and uh, he managed me. And I did a moonsault out of the ring where the guy standing there, and I didn't know my uncle was standing behind him. And so when I did the moonsault, I came out and hit him, and uh, it broke. His leg was messed up anyways, but it didn't help it. And it, it broke it where he couldn't walk after that. That's you know that's the worst. Not when you just hurt like your opponent, but somebody you love and respect. Oh yeah, yeah. You, I you, couldn't believe you, it. You just feel bad about it. Yeah. Oh, it's terrible. I couldn't believe it. You know, because you know, uh, I owe him the most. Besides my mother, I owe him the most in this whole world, and that would be the last thing I want to do. You know, the last thing. Sure. I would, I would like. After all this stuff, but he started. never he never bitched about it. He never said, yeah. you "Asshole, you broke my leg." He, he never <laughs> bitched. About it. That's some old school stuff. Yeah, he took it. And then Dusty thought that we had that bump uh, planned. <laughs> <laughs> we go, no, that wasn't planned. Uh, 
Sabu, had, after all this stuff that you've done, we, we always said, because we watched you, obviously, uh, a bunch. You know, and I say obviously because it was harder to watch people back then, you know, because we were on the road every night. So you had to really right. work hard right. to, to catch people. You know, it was, it was tough. Uh, but we wanted to catch you because you were doing so much amazing stuff. We always said you had rubber bones. H how do you feel uh, now? Um, you know, I'll tell you the truth. I felt better. I, I, I you know, uh, I, I don't feel real bad, but I feel pretty bad. You know, my my knee, my back, and my shoulder. Yeah, I need surgery. And uh, uh, I, I've been going to the gym lately, but I have to suck it up and go. It never says, "All right, today I feel good." It was like, "Fuck," you know. And uh, it's it's tough. Major surgery. But, but, major but surgery. That, have no, you had major surgeries and replacements, or what? I need a, I need the, my knee and my shoulder replaced, but uh, this thing got around to it. How long did it take you to recover from your shoulder? I hear that pretty painful. Well, I had my uh, hip replaced. It took me about oh, yeah. six months, yeah. three months. Yeah. yeah, two months. Six months till I felt like working out. Yeah, wow. They, the pain was gone the first day. Your your back and uh, your neck are your functional. My my neck is all right. It's my my back. I got spinal stenosis, and then my shoulder uh, need a complete replacement. And my knee also. Yeah. Wow. Wow. Do you know? No, you know, I, I can live with the knee. I can live with the knee, and I can live with the shoulder, but it's hard to live with my back. Yeah. Yeah. Do you know when you're going to have it done? Uh, no, I'm actually um, hopefully setting up for my final match. I want to do maybe a final match, maybe in July or later. You know, is this a Terry Funk final match or is this <laughs> no, a real final match? A real final. Match. I mean, well, just one more payoff. And uh, how, how so, many of Terry Funk's final matches did you have? Uh, I, I wrestled him in two retirements. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. <laughs> he, he probably had about four of them, but I wrestled him yeah. twice. Two of them. <laughs> you have an opponent picked out for your final match? Not, not exactly. It's probably, it's probably going to be Van Dam. I heard Van Dam say something about he wanted to have a barbed wire match. His last match, my last match, a barbed wire match. I said, yeah, whatever. That's good. Uh, but I'd rather just wrestle him in a regular match. I want to have one of my better matches. A barbed wire match, you know, that's a gimmick. I don't really want a gimmick. The gimmick is me, me uh, my final match. That's the gimmick. <laughs> right. And, and what what do you do now? Do, uh, everybody, every, you know, here, here's what's funny. People, people always ask me, what do you do now? And I get really like, well, not that much, but Rod, Rod, <laughs> Rod, Rod Simmons had the best answer I've ever heard. He goes, I have worked a long, with that James Earl Jones voice. He goes, I've worked a long time to do nothing. <laughs> he goes, I'm exactly. doing nothing. <laughs> well, so, uh, is what I do. I, I train a little bit and then uh, I do autograph signings on, on the weekends. Try to. Right. Where, 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 how, how can, how can our fans out there get a hold of you that want to, want to book you for these autographs? Um, my Twitter is at the real Sabu at ECW. Uh, I do a Twitch every Tuesday. Uh, that's called the real Sabu ECW Twitch. Uh, and then uh, Instagram is the real Sabu ECW. <laughs> They're all the real Sabu ECW. <laughs> <laughs> so it's easy to find. It's Rook Sabu, real C uh, Sabu. Are there, are there invitation Sabus out there now? Not, not, that, not that many anymore. Uh, it's not cool to be me anymore. <laughs> yeah, you know, it'd be one of those often imitated but more duplicated sound booth for sure <laughs> a, bu a buddy of ours had just told us that he's an imitation Jerry Briscoe he entered some like betting pool and he used Jerry's picture as his profile and he won so now, <laughs> so now, he, now he told Jerry he thinks Jerry's his good luck charm he's, that's awesome he's a fake Jerry Briscoe yeah, now I'm, I'm not more self franchise right. now for uh, for fantasy football. Right. <laughs> hey, well, Sabu, hey, th thanks so much for taking the time to join us. You know, I first met you at Bobby Duncan Jr.'s uh, funeral, and uh, you came oh, down, yeah. and yeah. I remember you 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 had a phone call with with uh, Paulie at the time that you know this was important to you, and I just I had so much respect for you for that for for missing a shot and coming down and. and doing the right thing for a friend. It just told me everything in the world I, to, that I need to know about you, that you, what a good, what a good dude you are. So it, when you. Jerry told me we had you on, I was so thrilled. So I, I really do appreciate coming on. I always love seeing you and it's great to see you today. Thank you, brother. It's always a pleasure to see you. Uh, yeah, thank, thank you. you. Thank you so much. I hope we're running into one of these autograph sessions. And, uh, yeah, I'll see you. You know, you know I, I was wondered what the fascination was with that bingo hall that there in Philadelphia. 
I got lucky about two years ago and I got to do an autograph session there. I, 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 yeah. I went in there and I could, I could, I could smell the bones. I could smell the fans and I could <laughs> roar the pop. Smell the broken bones. <laughs> yeah. I count the rest of the autograph thing, thing, right? The convention. Yeah. Yeah, I did the same thing. I walked, I, I literally had one of the ECW guys show me around and say, show me the dressing room, show me this, show me that. I literally had like a little, like a little kid. All, man. Yeah, right. it was fun. It's a legendary yeah. place that you made legendary, man. And, and be proud be proud of your career, what you've done, and man. You set the standard. You 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 wrote the books on a lot of different styles in this business, which is hard to do. It's hard to be an original in this business in Sabu. You're one of the originals. It's a pleasure being your friend. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you, Jerry. That means a lot. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.